Councillor Cordover, then Councillor Reid. Thank you, Mayor. My first question is about page five, uh, the top of the 1.1, the proposal there. It says each dwelling has approximately 12 square metres of secure storage, bin storage, a double garage, lift, private open space courtyard and deck areas. I can't see a lift anywhere. My question is, is there a lift? Mm. Ms Tyler Moore. Um, through you, Mayor, I just need to look at the plans again. Typically, if there are lifts provided, they often go to a common area. Um, no, I'm looking at the plans. So, um, page 39 of the report, you can see the lift shafts in each of those. So, they actually have put them in individual units. So, my question then is about, with the lift, it then says that uh, any roof um, mechanical stuff will be hidden behind the parapet. There's been no detail about the height of what that parapet will be. So if there is indeed a lift and all of the mechanism for the lift is going to have to go on the roof, where is the detail that says, and where is the confidence that we have that it will not um, uh, impinge upon the, um, the amenity? Uh, and there's a specific clause there that says that it's one of the performance criteria that says you, you can't have things on the roof that disturb the neighbourhood. Um, through you, Mayor, I, I believe you're referring to the overrun from the lift shaft because, as we know, the mechanism has to be above the lift. So I'm just having a look at the plans um, to have that detail. And just while you're looking at that, I'll clarify for people watching at home. Performance criteria D is that ensure the visual impact of mechanical plant and miscellaneous equipment, such as heat pumps, air conditioning units, switchboards, hot water units and similar, is insignificant when viewed from the street and then ensure rooftop service infrastructure including service plants and lift structures is screened so as to have insignificant visual impact and my question is i don't believe that there will be <laughs> insignificant visual impact that's, that's not my question my question Ms. is that's how okay. do we know <laughs> that there Ms. won't Tyler be well, it's a good question Ms. Tyler. um through you ma'am just having a look at the plans now um and i believe although um, I'm happy to double check it. Is that, for example, in the northwest elevation on the left hand side, you can see that the um, ceiling is higher in that area, and that may be where the lift shaft is looking at the layout. Um, no, it wouldn't be, sorry, because each of the four units is in there. So it's located sort of centrally on that. Um, northwest elevation. Are we confident that we will never see the lift shaft? I've never seen a lift shaft that isn't quite large when it goes on top of a roof, personally. So it might be a really, really high parapet, but it can only be eight point something metres high, right? So, anyway. Should we take that uh, on? You can't take it on notice because um, you need to make a decision today on the application. Um, I'm not sure whether there's a condition that specifically set it. Um, typically, yes, the parapets would be put up. The um, service area for those lift shafts um, for this type of lift is actually not that great. For the commercial ones, like in shopping centres and that, they're much bigger because they're a much bigger and heavier um, structures. So the residential ones typically aren't as big. But I can't, um, I can't give you that detail now looking at these plans. Um, but it could be a requirement if there was reservation, if there's not a condition there specifically about it, um, to say that the maximum height of the building is not to exceed a certain height, um, which is something that was done um, by the tribunal for the other set of units that are currently under construction. So that could be an amendment to the recommendation if the, if the council was of mind that they wanted to include that. Um, and then if it is built in, and I just can't pick it up on the plan, um, looking at it now, then it shouldn't be a problem. Um, and otherwise, they're going to have to think of the design for that. Mr Arnold seems keen to add. Um, thank you. Through you, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Cordova, um, my colleague has focused on uh, answering your question, looking at the report itself. But if you look at the uh, proposed condition for Part two, it addresses your question. What page is, is that on? And is covered. Okay. 
Thanks. Page 25. Okay. Uh, my next question is about... My next question is about uh, one of the acceptable solutions under design A1, so I'm looking at page 11, is that building design must comply with all of the following. Provide the main pedestrian entrance to the building so that it is clearly visible from the road or publicly accessible areas on the site. My question is, is it? And the reason for my question is, for unit four and unit one, I can understand that it would be, but how is it for unit two and three, the main pedestrian entrance to the building? How is that clearly visible? Ms. Tyler Moore. Um, through you, Mayor. So the, the clause is written, obviously, for an, usually for commercial development, which typically would have a single entry point. Um, this is units with their own um, entrance points. So it, it, the clause doesn't address those individual um, sections or the individual units well, because it's not what it was intended for. So if you look in on page 12, which follows on with the proposal is described, it gives you a, a um, description of all the compliances. So A, B, C, part one, D, E, F and G all comply. So it's only letter C that doesn't comply. And that's the frontage to Jen Jenkins Street, where the ground floor frontage of Jenkins Street elevation is a large wall of 60 metres squared. Um, so that's really to do with the passive surveillance, the large blank wall and then an ability to have glazing for passive surveillance. That's the only area that doesn't apply. So if you look at the plan that's just below that text, um, there's an, we've added in a diagram to just make it really clear, because it can be hard to follow the plans, about where that section is. Okay. Thank you. I respectfully disagree, though. I don't, I don't feel that it does. But uh, I'll now move on to my substantive. Um, so the clock starts now for my five minutes. This <laughs> with your permission, Mayor. This planning authority needs to assess the discretionary use under the acceptable solutions and performance criteria. Members of this planning authority, councillors around this table, have so far been saying, I don't like this proposal, but I have no choice. But of course, we do have a choice. We are part of the planning authority. We do have a choice. We don't always have to agree with the various assessments that are presented to us. An example would be that this proposal enhances the streetscape. That's a performance criteria. And I respectfully disagree. We're told by the planning staff that it enhances, and I disagree. In order to be approved, this proposal would have to apply with all the acceptable solutions for the local business zone. DA 2027-15 fails to comply with design A1. The proposal does not enhance the streetscape by satisfying all the criteria. The front facade has large expanses of blank wall that are not treated with architectural detail or public art so as to contribute positively to the streetscape and public space. It does not comply. I will not be voting for it. More broadly, it's not lost on me, or indeed probably any of the many, many people who contacted us to express their concern about this proposal, that we are in a particularly confusing situation because this is a set of apartments in the local business zone. So we're told that the Resource Management and Planning Appeal Tribunal had said previously, and I'm quoting from the report on page 18, that, quote, in summary, the tribunal was of the view that the proposal does not require consistency with the zone purpose statements, local area objectives, and desired future character statements, end quote. So it almost makes one wonder, what is the purpose of having zone purpose statements, local area objectives, and desired future character statements, if things like this... Um, sometimes it feels like these things are a means of making it tricky for a regular person to do a home reno, but give well-resourced developers at the top end of town a get-out-of-regulation-free card when they want to indelibly change the character of a neighbourhood when there's a whiff of profit in it. So we've heard many, many issues from community members, um, more than 30 certainly, but maybe more than 50 community contacts to me about things like zone purpose, use status in the local business zone, the precedent that this sets, the overshadowing, the design not fitting in, the heights and setbacks of landscaping and privacy and impact on views and traffic and parking and compliance. Firstly, zone purpose statements and use status. The response is that it doesn't fit the neighbourhood, but because Rampat previously said that this particular site doesn't require those, those assessments, it, it doesn't apply. And it kind of feels like a situation where if it's heads they win, if, it, if it's tails we lose, because when the neighbours raise issues like things of design, it says that the proposal is not in keeping with the Taruna Apartments, for example. That was a, a complaint from, from community members. The response in this report is that this is the local business zone. The design standards do not require that new buildings are in keeping with the Taruna Apartments design. 
it goes on to say, it is considered that the proposal will enhance the streetscape. So we've got a set of apartments, but we're assessing them as though they're in the business zone, so we have to assess them accordingly. And I take no umbrage with that. I just think that it's confusing to the community. And concerned community members have rightly pointed out that the eight metre high vertical walls, most of which are blank, are not architecturally detailed or treated with public art, which is in contravention of the, the performance criteria. And they say that they're not appropriate for the area. But of course, the response is that, well, in a business zone, you know, so again, we're, we're trying to judge a set of apartments, but they're in the local business zone, so we judge them as though they're a business almost. Uh, for example, in a business zone, residence, r residential is only allowed as permitted use if it's more than 25 metres setback or if it's not on the ground floor. This is both on the ground floor and not set back 25 metres. But this time, uh, it doesn't matter because it meets the performance criteria, uh, apparently, by enhancing the streetscape. Again, I respectfully disagree with that assessment. But then when it comes to driveways and traffic and parking and sight lines, the community has rightly pointed out that the sight lines do not comply with the 90 metres sight line that you require. But of course, when it comes to driveway and parking and traffic, this, we have to treat it as residential, right? It's a residential area, 50 kilometre an hour street, therefore you only need 45 metre sight lines. So occasionally, you know, heads they win, tails we lose. When, it's, when it suits this proposal, we're treating it like it's a local business, but when it doesn't suit, we're treating it like, um, like it's residential. So similarly, 40% of the ground floor needs to be glass if it's a local business, but we're told the passive surveillance can be limited here because it's not a local business, it's residential. So the report says on page 15, quote, there are no shops and offices proposed, so it is not appropriate to incorporate shop front windows and doors at the ground level where pedestrians can see into the building. You see the duality here. So in conclusion, putting aside all of my gripes with this process, how it can either be one thing nor the other. Time. I humbly Please request to that. finish my paragraph. Move, someone needs to move, extra time. Move, uh, Councillor Fox moves an extra one minute and uh, Councillor Midgley seconds it. All those in favour of an extra one minute for Councillor Cordova, please say aye. aye. Those against, motion is carried, Councillor Cordova. Thank you, Mayor. Putting aside all of my gripes with the process, in order to be approved, this proposal has to comply with all of the acceptable solutions in the local business zone and the performance criteria. It fails to comply with design A1. The proposal does not enhance the streetscape by satisfying the criteria. The front facade has large expanses of blank wall that are not treated with architectural detail or public art so as to contribute positively to the streetscape and the public space. The community doesn't want it, and neither do I. Thank you. Councillor Reid. They have told us and confirmed to us in the report that it meets the criteria. If it meets the criteria, regardless of our personal thoughts, we are sitting as a planning authority. And as I said, I don't like it, but I have to vote for it. And I would urge all other councillors, if you've got any questions to yourself, that you need to follow the expert advice, which of course is the planning staff. So they've suggest it be recommended for approval and there's no alternative. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Loss. So the debate being ended, the motion, I'm just trying to find it here. Apologies. Page 25, apologies. Uh, so the recommended motion is that the four multiple dwellings at 180 Channel Highway, Taruna, for Giamos, Developments Proprietary Limited be approved subject to the following conditions. There are all listed there, uh, 12 conditions and some advice. Was moved by Councillor Wasson, and seconded by Councillor Street. All those in favour, please say aye. Those against? Aye. Over division, all those in favour, please raise your hand. Councillor Street, Bastone, Reet, Westwood, Fox, Midgley, Wasson, Winter, and those against is Councillor Cordova. Motion's carried. Next item. Uh, Thank you, everyone.